Welcome to the first session of the BAA 2021 Summer Webinar. We're holding the webinar on Zoom and live streaming to YouTube. Um, the recording will be available to watch on our YouTube channel shortly after the end of the presentation. Um, you can ask questions by typing them into the Q&A on Zoom or the comments in YouTube and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. It's my pleasure to hand over to Alan Lorraine, the president of the BAA. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the, uh, the, the summer webinar for the BAA. Um, originally, the, uh, the meeting was due to take place in, uh, in Elgin, um, Scotland. Um, that was for 2020 and for 2021. Obviously, things have, have changed and we haven't been able to, uh, to, to meet in person for a long time now. Um, there are so, hopes that we may be able to uh, hold the meeting in Leeds, which is scheduled for the, uh, the beginning of, I think it's the 4th of September. Um, we're still in negotiation with them and Hazel Collette, the, uh, the BAA meeting secretary, is working hard with, with them. Um, there is obviously going to be a uh, significant reduction and we're, they're talking at the moment of about 43 people being able to attend. Um, so we will see how that goes and, and obviously any sort of social distancing arrangements that, uh, that are in place at the time. So we'll have to respect those. Uh, and a lot of people, I think, will just want to, uh, to, to play cautious and remain sort of, um, remain away. And the hope is that we will be uh, having a, a video stream from that, even if it, if it does take place in person, but uh, certainly to accommodate the people who aren't or aren't able to attend or, or don't want to. So as far as, as today is, is concerned, that um, we've got uh, Nicholas Perrow um, from Cardiff University. So by way of background, uh, his initial studies were undertaken at the uh, University of Grenoble in, in France before moving, moving up to Paris for his PhD, which was on observational star formation. And this was at the CEA Saclay which is the, according to Mr. Google, this morning is the French Atomic and Alternative Energy Commission. Uh, he then moved over to Manchester for a postdoctorate uh, post there um, for research uh, before moving back to the CEA in Paris to take up a Marie Curie uh, fellowship. Uh, 2013 saw him move to Cardiff to lecture astrophysics, um, where he remains, uh, having been made a senior lecturer in 2016 uh, and a reader in 2020. So his talk for today is the earliest stages of stellar cluster formation as shown on the screen. So without further ado, over to you, Nicholas. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me um, for this um, uh, seminar series. Um, so today I will be talking about uh, star cluster formation. Uh, and in particular, I will be talking about the earlier stages of star cluster formation. Um, so the first question we might ask is why do we care about star cluster formation really? Um, so what we have here in this image uh, is a very well-known um, star cluster, which is the Pleiades that you can see with the naked eye. Um, here on the bottom left, you have um, a scale bar. So this is one parsec uh, here, which for those of you who don't know what a parsec is, it is 3.3 light years roughly. Um, and just to give you a bit of a context in terms of size here, uh, if you would divide that uh, scale bar in a thousand small tiny pieces, um, the entire solar system would fit within one of those uh, pieces. So um, this cluster here, as you can see, is quite uh, sizable. It's a few parsec in size. Okay. Um, this particular cluster has something like 200 or so uh, stars in it. Uh, and this is quite typical for clusters, in fact. Uh, most stars in the galaxy and probably in the universe actually form in such uh, structures, in such groups of stars. So really, trying to understand star, uh, star cluster formation is exactly the same thing as trying to understand star formation in a world. So obviously, the question becomes, why do we care about star formation? There are plenty of reasons why you should care about star formation. but I'm going just to quote a couple here. So the, the first one is that it provides the initial conditions for planet formation. When you have a star forming, usually what you have around it at very early stages is you have a disk forming around that young star. And inside that disk will, uh, that disk will fragment, sorry, into, uh, into rocky bodies that will grow and start to form 
uh, planets and planetary systems. So if you want to have you know some understanding on on how our own solar system has formed, you really need to understand how stars form in the first place. Another important um, reason why we should care about star formation is that it is the rate of uh, star formation that dictates the pace at which galaxies evolve in the universe across cosmic times. So if you want to have an understanding on how uh, the universe evolved from the Big Bang to what we are at today, you really need to uh, nail down uh, star formation. And this can be illustrated with this uh, famous image of the Hubble telescope. Here you have, this, this is M51, which is a, uh, let's say, slightly smaller version of our own Milky Way. It's a bit smaller, but it's a spiral galaxy, and we think our Milky Way is a spiral galaxy as well. And what you can see on this image is that you have plenty of red patches, right? These red patches are star clusters, right? And you can see they are spread all over the galaxy. But in fact, if you look a bit more closely, they are not really spread all over the galaxy. In fact, they, are, they follow quite closely the spiral pattern of the galaxy, right? You see all of these red patches following this nice uh, grand design. We call them grand design spiral arms. And even more so than following the spiral arms, they in fact follow very, very closely uh, the dark lanes that you see in this image, these dark uh, black features that you see a bit everywhere. These dark lanes um, are therefore very well correlated with these dark clusters. What are those dark lanes? Dar these dark lanes is nothing else than cold dust, uh, which is absorbing the background stellar light. Right? And the only reason why we see them dark is because they are much colder than the average uh, gas and dust temperature around them. Uh, now, in the interstellar medium, dust is only 1% of the total mass. Most of the mass is in the form of gas um, and mostly hydrogen gas, because hydrogen is the most abundant atom in the universe. Now, if the gas is cold enough, and the fact that we see this dust in extension, in absorption, suggests that the gas is cold, then you tend to form not atomic gas, but molecular gas, right? And because hydrogen is the most abundant molecule, uh, abundant atom, sorry, the uh, most abundant molecule that you expect to form is molecular hydrogen. Now, the problem with high molecular hydrogen is that um, you can't really observe it, not in an easy way anyway. So what we need to go for, if we want to observe the gas phase, the molecular gas phase, is um, carbon monoxide, CO, which is the second most abundant molecule. And so that's what this um, image is showing here. This is an image of carbon monoxide of N51, roughly on the same scale. I'll try to, to rotate it so that it matches uh, roughly uh, the Hubble image. So this is a, a, an image from a work by Schinner and et al. in 2013. And you can see that uh, where you have a green, yellow, and red uh, patches means bright CO emission. And you see that they follow nicely the spider arm that you see in, uh, in extinction. So that means that molecular gas emission closely matches dust lanes. And because dust lane closely matches, matches young cluster, that means that molecular gas emission closely match uh, the distribution of young stellar clusters. Right. So there's a direct correlation between where the molecular gas sits and where the star clusters sit. So obviously what we want to do is here, this is a very large scale view of, of a galaxy. You see the scale here is 24 kiloparsecs, so that's huge. And what we want to see to have a handle on star formation is actually zoom in inside this uh, molecular glass, gas, this molecular clouds. So, Obviously, we can't do that in such an image here that we have because this is too far away. So in order to have a better detailed view of a molecular cloud, we need to go back to our own Milky Way. And that's what we have here on this image. So what we have here in the background in color scale, it's the a composite image in the infrared. Okay. So what is telling us is that wherever you have bright emission, where you have these yellow or white patches in the background, means bright infrared emission. And bright infrared emission is associated to star formation, star formation activity, right? So wherever you have bright emission here means star formation activity, stars that are currently forming. 
Now, on top of that image, we have these uh, white and gray contours a bit everywhere. These represent uh, an image of molecular hydrogen column densities. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, a, a H2 column density or molecular hydrogen column density tells you how many H2 molecules you have at every position on the sky per unit area, right? So now if you follow up these contours, you see that these contours kind of uh, close in here at the center. And that means that that's where you have the highest H2 column density. It's like it right here, right at the center. That means that that's the place, the location where you have the largest number of H2 molecules, which means they have you, the largest mass of molecular gas uh, is located right here at the center. But you can also see that you have other local peaks of H2 column density, like this one, for instance. It's not as big, it's not as strong as the central one, but still you have a, a moderate scale H2 column density peak there. And you can see that you have many others, right? Now, if you look at the background image associated with these H2 uh, column density peaks, you will see that, for instance, if you look at this one, you have a bright infrared emission associated to that peak. That means that that peak is associated to strong star formation activity. Now, it's the same for this very strong peak at the center. In the, we can't see it very well because it's a bit hidden by the contours, but, but in fact, this one is also at the center here is also uh, strongly linked to strong star formation activity. Now, if you look at all the other peaks, in fact, most of them are associated with star formation activity. Some, like the one at the bottom here, isn't. So it might mean that in the future, soon, um, it will start to form stars as well. So star formation activity is closely, cor closely correlated to the densest bits of these molecular clouds, the densest peaks. In fact, it's more than that. We know now that these young forming stars that are uh, responsible for this infrared emission that we see here, directly feed from their parent molecular cloud. They eat them, right? That's, that's how the, the, uh, the mass that end up in stars are from. Uh, they are basically molecular gas that has, that has somehow collapsed and ended up in, 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 a, in a star. And that's how you, you, the stars are basically formed in a very brief uh, way. Now, you, um, you see here again that the scale is relatively large. This is 10 parsec, right? So remember, the solar system, for instance, is, is much smaller than that. It's 0.001 parsec. Right? So what we want to do is to zoom in a bit, a bit more in this type of cloud to see what, what's going on. So here, on the next image, I will show you a zoom of the central, uh, the highest column density peak that we have at the center. So on the left, here, it's the same image as before. Uh, I showed you 40 parsec scale here. And if you zoom in that central bit, you get this image here. Again, this is a H2 column density image of the central part of the cloud. So yellow here means high column density of H2. So that's where most of the mass molecular gas sits. That's right at the center where this, you have the yellow bit. And then it decreases in kind of filamentary shape here. Now, the size of that structure that we call clump, so clump is typically a parsec size over density of molecular gas. Yeah, here it's three parsec, roughly in size. Um, this uh, clump here typically will form a star cluster. And how we know that is because for there are many reasons that, that indicate that's the case. But one of them, for instance, is if we look at the size of typical young stellar clusters, uh, like the Pleiades, we know that this type of clusters is typically a few parsec in size. And most clusters are like that, very, very young in age. So soon after they finish forming, we see that their size is a typical of the size of what we call a clump, a gaseous clump. Okay? There are plenty of other evidence that suggests that indeed cluster clusters form inside, uh, inside such clumps. But basically the conclusion of that comparison is to say that clumps these clumps here, these structures, uh, are the progenitors of star clusters. But so this statement raise, um, uh, raises a question, which is the following, which is if uh, indeed star clusters only form in parsec scale structure, it means that something must be happening at that particular scale, right? If you look at the image of the molecular clouds in contours here, um, this is a continuous 
because it was fluid. There's no, at least when you look at it like that, there's no obvious discontinuity in that cloud, right? But despite that fact, it seems that something must be happening at parsec scales because that's where star clusters form. So the question is the following, is there some sort of discontinuity in the properties of the molecular gas on clump scale? And that's the question we are going to try to answer now. Uh, so what I'm going to present now is a very recent study that hasn't been published yet. In fact, uh, it should be submitted soon. Um, and uh, hopefully I will be clear enough and that will be understandable by everyone. Okay, so how do we try to answer this question? Well, our approach is relatively simple. Right? You, have, uh, you have a number of energy sources in molecular cloud, but two dominant ones are on one side gravity and on the other side, what we call turbulence in the form of kinetic energy. So what gravity tried to do, obviously, is to try to bring things together, to collapse the gas, right? To, to bring it uh, to a single uh, point, basically. On the other side, we have turbulence, which is a chaotic motion of the gas. The origin of that turbulence in the uh, interstellar medium is, um, has, many, has many different sources. Um, it could be, for instance, uh, the explosion of a supernova that releases a lot of energy and momentum back into the gas and therefore random motion created by this in, in, inflow of, of energy and momentum. It could also be the shear from uh, the rotation of the galaxy. So when you have gas rotating around the center of a galaxy, you have differential rotation that basically creates shear between two different pieces of gas and that triggers chaotic motion of the gas. So you have a number of different possible origin for, for this turbulence, but we know it is there, we observe it. So we know that there's a lot of kinetic energy in that turbulence. And what that turbulence does is try to tear the gas apart, right? It's a kind of a pressure term. It tries to oppose basically gravity. Gravity tries to bring things together, turbulence tries to get things apart, right? And these are two main uh, energy sources. So what we are trying to do here, what we want to do, is basically to take a sample of clouds uh, and try to measure as a function of their radius, um, the ratio of gravity versus turbulence. Right? That's, um, that's basically what we want to do and see if indeed at clump scale, there is some sort of discontinuity. There is something happening at clump scale in that ratio that for instance, what we would expect for instance, since stars form on clump scale is that gravity starts to dominate only at Clump scale on the few parsec scale. Right. That would be the uh, expected outcome. Let's see if that's what we get. So how do we how do we compute these quantities? How do we compute the uh, gravitational potential energy uh, using observations? So what we want is to obtain something like this, what we have here. So that's mass versus radius, and we want that for all the clouds that we are going to observe. Right. So. Um, no, sorry, uh, we want to to gravitational energy, sorry, which is here, um, uh, written here. Something that you probably, all of you is familiar, uh, is familiar with, something that you uh, learn um, um, at uh, high school. So here you have a constant, uh, that's a gravitational, um, uh, gravitational constant, uh, G. M is the mass uh, enclosed within a given radius of your molecular cloud squared, divided by the radius of uh, of that cloud. So to, in order to compute this, what we need is to obtain such a thing. So a mass profile, right? That's what we call a mass profile, which is mass as a function of radius. If we have that, then it means that we have the mass as a, at every radius. And so we can compute that quantity U for every uh, radius. Now, uh, as far as turbulence is concerned, what we want is to compute the kinetic energy, which is related to that turbulence. And the formula for that is three and a half of m sigma squared. Something again that you are probably all familiar with, which is more like some of the thing that we are probably familiar with is half of m b squared. But that's essentially the same thing. The reason why there is a three is because the velocity dispersion, when we observe it, it's along the line of sight. It's not a 3D velocity dispersion. So we need to have a factor that correct for that. So that's why you have a three in front of it. Uh, now, sigma here is the velocity dispersion of the gas. So it means that when you have gas, right, a molecular cloud, you have uh, H2 molecules in it, and they have random motion, right? And so to 
quantify that randomness of the kinetic motion of the gas, what we want to observe is the standard deviation of the velocities, what we call the velocity dispersion. I will come back onto this. Right? So what we want to be able to compute that kinetic energy is to have a velocity, velocity dispersion profile, such as here, so velocity dispersion versus radius uh, for every cloud. So how do we uh, now compute those? How do we compute this mass and velocity dispersion profiles? So here on the right, you have an image that I already showed you, right? Remember, background is the infrared emission that shows the star formation activity. But what we are most interested in, in, for, in, in, in for the purpose of this slide is the contours. So the contours are H2 molecular hydrogen, colonicity it tells you the amount of uh, molecules you have per unit area at every point on that map. So if you know uh, how many H2 molecules you have per unit area on every point, if you compute the area of your cloud, right, and you multiply by the H2 colonicity, you know the number of H2 molecules in your cloud. The mass of an H2 molecule is very well known, and so it means that you can easily get the mass of the entire cloud. Right? Now you can do that for, for instance, let's say if you look at the uh, uh, outer contours, we can do that for the full cloud here, right? And we'd get a large mass. And then the radius corresponding to that part of the cloud would just be the radius of the disk that has the same area as your cloud. That's something that people do often because obviously these things are not, they are not circular, they're not spherical. So we need to find a way to, to get a size for it. And that's a standard way. We basically look at the area of the cloud within a given contour. We say, what's the disk that has the same area? And we take the radius of that disk as the radius of, your, of our cloud. So that's what we do. And then we can repeat the same operation for increasing isocontours, right? And so we get smaller, smaller structures uh, with smaller, smaller mass. And then we mean we can get a mass profile for our cloud. Now for velocity dispersion, it's a bit, a, a bit more complicated, but not so much so. So what we do here is that for each of the contours, again, on the same map, we average a molecular line emission for a particular tracer. So here, for instance, what we have on this uh, series of spectra is average spectra in a uh, carbon monoxide in different isocontours of the map that we have here. So if you look at the first spectrum on the left, uh, we see that here is written radius 20, almost 23 parsecs, so that the larger scale that's corresponding, in fact, to that contour here. And that spectrum that we see here is the 13 CO spectrum average within that contour. Okay. And then we look, we fit it, and we look at the width of it, and the width gives us the velocity dispersion of the gas uh, in that, at that particular scale. Okay? And then we repeat the exercise again for smaller contours. So this one is, at, is, a, is one which has a radius of 7.3 parsec. We get the average spectrum here, uh, and again at 5.3 and at 3.4. And so we repeat the process, and we compute the width, and we get a velocity dispersion profile. There is a problem though in that technique. So all this is relatively simple, but there is a problem is that there isn't a unique tracer that we can use for all uh, radius ranges, for all density regimes. So for instance, if we look at, so the, as I said, the one that we are using in that particular image, so in this plot here, in this spectra, and, and what we use to compute this H2 column density is a, a 13CO, which is a isotopologue of carbon monoxide. So this isotopologue, isotopologue in particular is very good at tracing molecular clouds on large scale. But if we look closely at what's going on inside that peak, for instance, then it's not, be, it's not, it's not so good anymore. And the reason is that um, they, these uh, molecular lines become what we call optically thick. So basically it means that at some, at some point uh, when you have so much emission, then uh, you have, uh, in, in, on top of the emission of the molecules, you also have absorption. In, and so the intensity of the line doesn't correlate anymore with the total amount of H2 molecules that you have along the line of sight. Right? So if you would measure the mass based on the emission there at the very center, then uh, the mass that you would get would be underestimated compared to what it is. So you can't use it. So you need a, 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 a set of tracers to be able to compute this mass profiles and velocity profiles all the way uh, at all radii. And so we used 
for this, this particular study, we used three different traces to probe the dense part of the cloud and the diffuse part of the cloud. So here is an example, I mean, an illustration of it. So again, here's our mass profile. In, in purple, that's the dense part of the profile. In green, that's the diffuse part of the profile. That's how I call them. And so for the mass profile, what we use for the dense part is dust continuum emission, which is a very good tracer of the mass. Um, and on the diffuse part, we use 13 CO integrated emission, which is what I showed you on the previous, on the previous image with these contours. Right? Now for the velocity dispersion, um, in the dense part, we use a molecule called diazelinium uh, or n 2 h plus, which is known to be a very, very good tracer of dense coal gas, which is the case for the dense bits of molecular clouds. Um, and for the diffuse part, the, the problem with that molecule is that it's only uh, present in the dense bits. There's no n 2 h plus in the diffuse part, so we can't use it for the diffuse part. We can only use it for the dense part. And 13CO, we use it for uh, the diffuse part. As we've seen before, it's very good for the diffuse part, but it's be becoming optically thick for the dense part. So we can't use it for the dense part. We can only use it for the, for the diffuse part. So it's by using this combination of tracers that we are then able to compute mass profile and velocity dispersion profile of molecular cloud. So even though that might seem relatively, at least in principle, easy, this has never been done before. Um, and so that would be the first time it's done. Okay, so now the uh, sample. So, so far I talked about the methodology, how we're gonna do things. Now I'm going to show you a bit more in detail the data itself. So what we've done is to select a sample of 27 clumps or this you know, parsec scale, structure, parsec scale structure that tend to form star clusters. So we uh, looked at 27 of them. Um, and here you have four of those. Uh, you can see that they are all parsec scale in size. This is one parsec in all of them. You can also notice that they have different uh, shapes. This one is more fil filamentary and fragmented. This one is filamentary, not fragmented. These one are more roundish. Um, and they have very different masses. Uh, some are, uh, have 300 solar masses, others 20,000, and sizes between one and six parsec. So now, that's the data for, uh, for um, the clumps. So these are H2 column density images obtained in dust continuum emission, as I mentioned earlier. Now we looked also at uh, their parent molecular clouds. Um, so these are the four parent molecular clouds of the four clumps that we had uh, on the previous slide. And the column density here shown in contours has been estimated from the 13 CO integrated intensity, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and the background here, again, is in, uh, a composite image in the infrared showing star formation activity. And so now, uh, so the, the, these uh, molecular clouds now, they are larger, right? They are basically 10 parsec to 60 parsec in size. They are parent molecular clouds of the clump, so it's normal that they are larger. They're also obviously more massive between 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 solar masses. And so now using these contours and using the method that I described earlier, we can uh, estimate the mass and the radius for each of these contours, for each of these clouds, using the parent molecular cloud data, so this data, along with the clump data here. Right? So we have everything to compute a mass profile using this, uh, this data set. Now, regarding the uh, velocity dispersion profile, we use the same the methodology that I described before. We compute the average spectra within every isocontours on the map that I showed you earlier. And we do that for all uh, radius, for all contours. So here, for instance, it's for one specific cloud. This is the largest uh, ISO contour, so 23 parsec scale. This is the average 13 CO spectrum. We get the width of it, so the velocity dispersion. And then we go up in H2 column density, so we go down in size. Uh, this is the diffuse data measurement, so that use 13 CO data. And here is the dense part measurements using N2H plus. So you can notice straight away that the N2H plus spectra are a bit weird. There are three groups here, and that's because of the structure of the line emission for that particular molecule. Uh, we say that N2H plus has a hyperfine structure to it, and which means that instead of having only one uh, line, it has, a, in fact, 
uh, three groups of lines altogether. This is actually very good because it allows us to measure velocity and velocity dispersion very, very accurately, in fact. Uh, and so um, now we have that, we basically can construct a velocity dispersion profile from such data. And we have that for every 27 clouds that we have looked at. So now what do we get from that? That's what we get here. So what we have here on the left, let's start with the left plot. This is a mass profile for one cloud, right? So the purple points are the dense parts, right? So here you have mass and radius. Um, and here, this is a diffuse part. Now you see on this particular plot, you have three different colors for the diffuse part. Um, it's because we can, you can estimate um, mass and velocity dispersion in three different ways. Um, I'm not going into details here. I'm just gonna say that the best way is the green plot. Uh, so in the next plot I'm gonna show you, I will drop the red and the other one and we have just the green one, okay? Um, but what we have here, then is the mass profile, so mass versus radius for one cloud, diffuse uh, dense measurements and diffuse measurements. In the middle plot, we have the velocity dispersion versus radius, same diffuse points, uh, dense points, sorry, and diffuse point, diffuse measurements. And then what we have here is something that we call the varial ratio. So the varial ratio is defined here. So this is twice the kinetic energy in the turbulence divided by the gravitational energy. <coughs> Sorry, the, I made a mistake here. This uh, absolute symbol should be around the uh, potential energy because the potential energy is negative. So we want to, so I made a small mistake here. But anyway, it's twice the kinetic energy divided by the gravitational energy. And so it's a measurement of that tells you um, if gravitational energy is dominating over kinetic energy or if it's the other way around. Good, so now that we, we are clear on this, what we've done is to put all the data, point, data point, points together. So again, it's the same as before, we have mass versus radius, but in, instead of having one cloud, here we, I put all the 27 clouds on the same plot, okay? And so what you can see here is that, um, obviously the mass increases with the radius, as you increase the, size, the, the radius of the molecular cloud within the molecular cloud, you have more and more mass. So it's not surprising that the mass increases, but you can see you have very specific shapes. Uh, the purple points seems to curve slightly, and then they meet here, but they seem to have a, a difference in terms of how they behave. Right? The slopes of these diffuse point and dense points seem to be slightly different. Now for the velocity dispersion, there's a even more striking difference in how the, the points behave, right? If you look at the purple points or so the dense part of the clouds or the, of the clumps, um, you see that it's basically flat, which means that the velocity dispersion doesn't change much when you look at uh, the three parsec scale of a clump or deep within the clump itself, velocity dispersion seems to be very similar while the velocity dispersion of the diffuse part of the molecular cloud seen in 13CO decreases. But what you can see that they don't really seem to meet nicely, right? There's a clear discontinuity in velocity dispersion here. We'll come back onto that later. And now here it's a velocity dispersion, uh, the uh, VR ratio, sorry, radius VR ratio here. And what you can see here, the main point to see is that the values between the dense and the diffuse part are not very different. And they are all, or not all, but almost all beyond a value of two. A value of two is the limit where if you are underneath that value, then gravity is dominating. You have more gravitational energy than kinetic energy. If you are above that line, kinetic energy is dominating. You have more kinetic energy than gravitational energy, right? So what we see here that it seems that at every radius, most of the gas in the cloud is what we would call gravitationally bound, which means that gravity is dominating over kinetic energy. But we see we have some discontinuities here, and this is a bit uh, odd because at the same, that basically what we are saying here is that at the same radius, whether we measure the velocity dispersion in N2H plus or in 13CO, we don't get the same answer. We get different velocity dispersion, and this is a bit odd. So we wanted to see if there was any problem in data, if that was just a matter of um, a, a systematic bias in the way we measure things. So what we've done here is to do some simple modeling. 
So we say, okay, let's assume that our clouds are spherical. Obviously, they aren't, but for the purpose of this um, of this test, it's not really a big problem. So we take we say our clouds are spherical; they are spheres. And now we say they have a certain density profile, right? So that's here: this density, mass density versus radius, right? Obviously, it's denser at the center; it's lower density at the at the outer outskirts of the cloud. Um, and we say it behaves in a certain way. Then we do the same for velocity dispersion. Uh, we say velocity dispersion increases with radius because it's in the, what, it's what we see. Um, uh, and uh, again, we say that there's a certain behavior to that velocity dispersion profile. And so we construct, we construct a model cloud with these two profiles. So that's a 3D model. Now what we do is that we project it on the plane of the sky because Astronomers, that's the only data that we have access to. It's projected quantity, right? We don't have access to the third dimension along the line of sight. So we take that model and we project it on the on the on the on the plane of the sky, and then we convolve it with the angular resolution of the data, all the biases, the the, the specificities of uh, the data that we have taken. And, and then we see how these compare to um, to the observations. And in particular, we can see if this, just the fact that we, we project the cloud on the sky and we simulate our observations, would that be enough to reproduce the profiles that we do, that we do observe? And the answer is yes. So what we have here on the top row is the data, the same plot that I showed you before. Right? I'm just highlighting one particular cloud in, in, in with that dark red um, brownish color here. But that's the only difference. This is the, the data. So mass, mass profile, resistance dispersion profile, VAL ratio profile. Okay. Now in the middle is the best model for each of the clouds once it's projected on the sky. Right. And we see here that we do reproduce a all basically a feature that we observe. So for instance, you see if you look focus in the observations in the purple points in the mass profile, you see that they have this curvy shape. In the modeled profile, we also see this curvy shape, same. Um, and we see that they meet well and nicely, and we see exactly the same thing in the model. Even more interesting uh, is that we do reproduce in the velocity dispersion profile that's discontinuity. Okay. And the reason why there is this discontinuity is because when you project on the sky, right, when you look at a given a projected radius on the sky. You have a lot of gas which is in front and behind of the cloud, which is not part of that sphere of that given radius, right? You have projection effect. You have gas which is contaminating in front and behind. That gas which is in front and behind might have a very large velocity dispersion, uh, much larger than the velocity dispersion of the gas within that sphere of, of a given radius. And so you will tend, when you use 13CO, you will tend to overestimate uh, the velocity dispersion just by projection effect. And that's what this model seems to show. Uh, and again, if you look at the virial ratio profile, we observe, we reproduce exactly the same kind of um, behaviors with some curve shapes, <clears throat> some increase of velocity uh, of virial ratio when we decrease the radius. And the last row, finally, is the input model. What we had to put in the 3D model to reproduce this red, to get these red profiles. And so what we had to put in this model is the following. For the mass profile, we had to put a, uh, a, um, a discontinuity at roughly a few parsecs in size. So basically, the inner part of the model had to be denser than the diffuse part by quite a bit. For the velocity dispersion profile, we had to say that the velocity dispersion in the dense bit was flat, while the velocity dispersion was increasing quite sharply outside a couple of parsecs. And that translates into a variable ratio, which is like that, where the limit between bound and unbound is given by this uh, dashed blue line and this uh, shaded gray area. And we see that all clouds at almost all radii stand below that line, which means that they are gravitationally bound, that there's no, we don't see, looking at this, we don't see any discontinuity at Clum scale. We, don't, we can't say that gas is becoming gravitationally bound under a few parsec scale. That's not the case. The clouds are virtually bound everywhere. But what we do see is a discontinuity in the velocity dispersion profile and the density and the mass profile at a few parsec scale. So 
if we want now to answer the question, is there some sort of discontinuity in the properties of the molecular gas on Clump scale? The answer is yes, there is. The gas on Clump scale is, becomes dynamically decoupled from the rest of the molecular cloud. So the rest of the molecular cloud is relatively, uh, is there, is relatively stable, uh, is happy, gravitationally bound, but not collapsing. But then on Clump scale, for some reason, the clump becomes unstable. Uh, and start to collapse. And what we see in the in velocity, the, the difference that we see here, the fact that we have a decrease and then a flattening, that would be due to the fact that on that scale, the clumps are collapsing. So they have a different dynamics than the gas, which is beyond the few clump uh, parsec scale, where the gas is probably stable. Okay. Now, this has also a number of consequences um, in terms of not just cluster formation, but also massive star formation. If, for instance, a clump like the one that we see here is fully collapsing, there are some models, numerical models, that show that that is very, very helpful to form massive stars. And massive star formation is something that we really don't understand much. So, and the reason why that's helpful is because if the full thing is collapsing, then at the bottom of the potential well, you have a lot of gas which is, um, which is um, incoming. And so that particular location at the bottom of the potential well is a favorite location for the formation of massive stars, simply because that's where you have a lot of mass coming in. So I think I'm going to stop here. I'm not sure what I'm doing in terms of time, but um, I'll stop here and um, I'm happy to take any question. Thank you, Nicholas. That's a really great sort of, um, presentation of how sort of real research and science and astronomy is done on a, a fascinating topic. Um, just to remind everyone, if you would like to answer a question, yep. um, then please type in the Q&A on Zoom, which in most people you should find at the bottom of the uh, screen. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, you can type in the uh, comments and we'll pick it up. Um, at the moment, we have a question from Michael Omer which is what does 13 CO mean? Yes, that's a, good, that's a good question. So as I said, the second most abundant molecule in the interstellar medium is carbon monoxide, which is C, which we call CO for carbon and oxygen. Um, the most abundant version of carbon is 12 CO. That's, that's the one that we, we found uh, most commonly in, uh, in space. Uh, the thing is 12 CO, so or just CO, uh, is very, very abundant, and which means that it can become very easily what we call optically thick, which is when it's so you have so much emission that, in fact, you have so much other molecules that uh, the amount of uh, emission that you see from this molecule does not correlate anymore with the amount of gas that you have, right? And that's not really nice. So what we want is something which is a bit less optically thick. And so if we, yeah, we use 13CO, 13C being a, an isotopolog of carbon, so it's a different version of carbon, um, it's less abundant and it's less optically thick. So it allows us to see a bit deeper inside the cloud. Um, so that's what it is. It's just a different version of carbon monoxide, uh, uh, optically thinner, slightly optically thinner. Thank you. Um, and I think it, it might be fair to say that um, typically astronomers don't get too much involved in chemistry. Yeah. But there is some important chemistry which goes on in particular with the interstellar medium. Yes. And and gas clouds. Yes, so, yes, indeed. So molecules tend to form. Um, so most of the gas is atomic, um, at least initially. But then in cold environments, such as molecular clouds, you can form molecules, uh, for instance, uh, uh, on the uh, surface of dust grains, in fact. Even though dust grains you know, they are just 1% of the total mass, they are very useful in many, many ways. And one of these ways is to actually form molecules. So H Two uh, hydrogen atoms, for instance, have a very, very small probability to meet in the gas phase. Right? They were very unlikely that they will find each other. But what they do is that they basically collide with dust grains, which are bigger, and then they get, they get uh, stuck to it. And then they move at the surface of that dust grain. And this is a much more efficient way for them to meet and form a H2 molecule. So that's what, how we think that H2, which is the most abundant molecule in space, is formed, is mostly formed at the surface of those grains. Yeah, fascinating, which isn't necessarily what you kind of think just coming coming from it, coming to it blind. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple more questions come in. Um, 
Bruce Fairbanks asks, do we know why the shapes of the clumps are so different? Another uh, very good question here. Um, the straight answer is no. <laughs> um, but so the way, so the, in, 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 in these molecular clouds, as I already discussed, you have a number of energy sources. You have gravity, which is very important to form stars. Without gravity, you wouldn't collapse gas. You wouldn't form any stars. You have turbulence, uh, but you also have magnetic fields that I haven't talked about here, for instance, which is also an important source of energy in, in the interstellar medium. And depending on which one is dominating at a given scale at a given time, um, then the gas will get compressed in different directions, in different ways, and that will lead to different shapes. So filaments, for instance, there's a lot of literature on filaments uh, for the past decade now. Uh, filaments, for instance, are believed uh, to form when you have two pieces of gas, probably uh, who has certain kinetic energy, certain you know, motion due to turbulence that collide with each other, form a sheet of gas that then fragments into filaments, for instance. So that, what I'm trying to say here is that you have a lot of different processes that dominate at different time and different in different scale that lead to different shapes. Uh, that's basically what we think is happening. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question from Daryl Dobbs. Um, hi, Daryl. Um, I've been exchanging emails with Daryl about to do with the variable star section, but uh, yet to meet in person. And he asks, does external influences like supernova make much contribution to starting the collapse of a molecular cloud? No, very good questions indeed. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of research on it and it's very much debated, I would say. So um, supernova are extremely um, powerful. So if you have, let's say, if you have, mole if you have already pre-existing molecular gas around a supernova, it will be completely, um, oh, it will be mostly destroyed. However, it is possible that, um, that there is some what we call self-shielding. So, which means that you have, so a supernova explosion will basically radiate a lot of, you know, energy back in the interstellar medium. You would have a gas that would get compressed. And then the gas, which is just behind that first compressed layer might be shielded from the radiation and energy from, from the supernova itself. And so that gas then might be able to cool, but it's because it's slightly denser, it has been compressed and then might form molecular gas and then that molecular gas might collapse to form stars. So um, the answer is, we think that it might happen. Uh, there is some research about it, but there's a lot of debate about it as well. So it's not really clear. Overall, it's very likely that supernova have more a negative impact in terms of star formation, but it might be possible that in some specific locations, sometimes it has a positive impact in the, in the sense that it does trigger star formation. Thank you. Um, and now we have an, a question from Alex Pratt, which is, do electrostatic forces play a role in the clumping in molecular clouds? Uh, yeah. So that's again, uh, <laughs> people watching this are, are quite, um, are quite uh, well uh, I don't know, instructed. I don't know how you say that. <laughs> well, well versed in the, in the topic. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so uh, as I just mentioned, there is a, a, a source of energy that I haven't talked about during that talk, which is uh, magnetic fields, right? And um, magnetic fields um, will basically interact with the gas through ions. So, um, so electrostatic forces probably doesn't have much of an impact, um, but magnetostatic forces or even magnetohydrodynamic forces probably has an impact. And so what happens is that what we think happens <clears throat> is that you have a very small fraction of the, the atoms and molecules in, in an interstellar region, which are in the form of ions. It's something like maybe 10 to the minus or something, uh, 10 to the minus seven, sorry. Um, so that would be one ion per, uh, what is that? Uh, 10 million, something like that, 10 million atoms. Uh, so it's a tiny amount, right? But even if it's tiny amount, if these ions are uh, feel the magnetic fields, right? It means that what ha what's going to happen is that they're going to be stuck to the magnetic field. They, when they try to move because of turbulence, let's say, they will go back to where their initial position because of magnetic forces. Um, and 
in turn, because ions will collide with neutrals, uh, the neutrals will feel indirectly these magnetic forces to the collision with the ions. And so if you have a strong magnetic field, even if you have, don't have many ions, it could be that you prevent altogether the gas from collapsing because of the magnetic fields and that interaction between ions and neutrals. Um, so that was a model that was being proposed already uh, very early on in the uh, late 70s, in fact, uh, early 80s, um, where people thought that the low star formation activity in the Milky Way, because for instance, the, the, in the Milky Way, we know that there's only one solar mass worth of stars which is formed every year. And this is very, very small, and we don't really understand why. And people thought that maybe you have strong magnetic fields that prevent the gas from collapsing altogether, except for in small location, which would lead to a small star formation rate in our galaxy. Um, but now there are other models that show that might, that might not be the case. But so to answer the question is that uh, electrostatic, probably not so much, but uh, magnetic fields, uh, Yes, probably they do, they do play a big role. And anyway, magnetic fields and electrostatic fields are very much closely related, so. Thank you. Um, we don't have any more questions from, oh, I think another question's just coming from the audience, which is from Daryl Dobbs. Um, he's asking, will turbulence cause the outer fringes of the cloud to disperse into the galaxy? Um, so the answer is, uh, Probably yes. So, so it's true that let's say you have a let's say you have an isolated ball of gas, right, which is uh, self gravitating, just in equilibrium. So it has enough kinetic energy in it um, uh, to prevent the gas from collapsing, but it doesn't have too much that it completely disperses. Gas, yeah, the, the molecules in that gas will have don't we won't have exactly the same velocity. That would be a dispersion, and so we have a tail of distribution of. Uh, velocities for each molecule. In these tails, some of these molecules will have a large velocity, and they might have um, enough kinetic energy to indeed leave the cloud. That's indeed uh, possible, right? So if they have um, a velocity which is uh, large enough, they might just escape the gravitational field of the cloud and then disperse. So you might have a, a bit of dispersion that way, diffusion that way, I don't know how you call it, but but it's 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 a tiny tiny fraction of the mass. Thank you. Um, and we have a question from William Scutcher, which is: How does the metallicity affect the collapse and behavior of the clumps? Okay, so <clears throat> so the metallicity is indeed an important parameter. So it's something that I never look never look at because I always look at clouds. Uh, that are in our Milky Way, uh, roughly in the same place, and the metallicity is roughly uniform. But um, metallicity uh, is very important indeed, um, because uh, depending on whether you, you have a lot of metals or not, you will be able to cool or heat your gas in different ways. So for instance, one of the main coolants, uh, what makes molecular glass remain cold, is because you have a lot of dust and a lot of CO. Right. So, so through radiation, when you have when all the emission that we detect here is energy which was initially in the cloud and then that has been, that has been radiated away by these molecules and this dust, right? I mean that you know, the energy has to come from somewhere. So basically that's energy which is radiated away, okay? So it's cooling, the, 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 it's the cooling, we are witnessing the cooling of the cloud basically. If you don't have carbon, if you don't have oxygen, if you don't have dust, you just cannot cool. Right? The cloud will, will, won't cool, it won't be cold, it will be hot. If the cloud is hot, it means that the gene's mass, which is something that uh, basically is a limit for how big a cloud can be before it collapses, uh, the gene mass will be larger. It might be so large that the cloud might not collapse at all. If the mass of the total gas is smaller than gene's mass, the cloud will not collapse. So it's why also, that's one of the reasons why we believe that early days in the evolution of the universe, stars were a lot more massive than today. And that's because early days, um, early times in the, in, the, in the evolution of the universe, you didn't, you didn't have many uh, metals, you didn't have many carbons, you didn't have many oxygen because they all come from the center of stars. So you need to have stars with, which have exploded so that you have carbon, oxygen, dust, and all these things. So early on, you didn't have any of it. And so the temperature of the gas was a lot larger. 
and the genes mass was a lot larger. And so to collapse a full cloud, you need a lot more mass. And so that's why we believe that uh, very early in the universe, the first stars were basically very, very uh, massive. Very good question again. Great. Uh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> I was about to say we had a loss, but no, we've got another question which is coming from Michael Omer, which is um, following up on what you said about low star formation in the Milky Way. You said one a year. How do we know this so definitively? Uh, so obviously, this you know, it's like in any science when you have a measurement, you have uncertainty around that value. So it's not exactly one year. We think it's about uh, between 0.5, I think, to maybe two or three solar masses a year, right? But still, it remains it remains around one. It remains small. Um, the the way you can you can measure this is a, a number of ways. Um, so usually it, it starts with uh, counting stars. It's as simple as that. So if you know how many uh, stars are there and what's the age of these stars, uh, you can walk back your way of how how much star formation I needed in the past, you know, couple of billion years so that I have the stellar population that I have today, right? It's a backtracking uh, process, basically. Um, so that's one way by looking at stellar population. Other people look also at the young stars, the very, the infrared stars that you can see, uh, you can, you can, you know, count them again. You can try to measure how many are there in the galaxy. And then you know their lifetime, roughly speaking. All this is uncertain, but you roughly know their lifetime. So you know the, the total mass of young star, you know their lifetime, you divide by the two, you have a star formation rate. Uh, and all these numbers, all these different ways of measuring that star formation rate leads roughly to the same number of about one solar mass per year. Uh, now, if you look at all the molecular gas that you have in the galaxy, right? We, we can measure all the molecular gas that, are, that is in molecular cloud in the Milky Way. And if we say, let's say that this star collapse in a, what we call a free fall time, which is how much time it takes for the cloud, the cloud just under gravity to, uh, to collapse and become to a single point. If we would have had that, then we would have something like two to 300 solar masses per year worth of star formation rate, uh, which means that that's one of argument to say that clouds on at least as a whole cannot be uh, collapsing because otherwise we would see a much larger star formation rate in our galaxy. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good explanation. And I think that might be the last of the questions, which is uh, very good timing. Um, I'm pleased to say we've had about um, 45 people watching us across Zoom and YouTube this morning. Um, this is just the first session of the um, BA summer webinar. At 2.30 this afternoon, we have Dr. Amy Bonsor on the um, interesting topic of planet eating white dwarfs. So look forward to learning about that. Um, so I'd like to say thank you once again to Dr. Nicholas Pareto for uh, joining us um, on this uh, Saturday morning to give thank us a fascinating everyone. talk.